Hello and welcome back to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we have another author interview today and uh, we've got ourselves uh, Aisha Bushby. She is a young adult uh, writer, uh, a YA or a teen fiction. And um, who better to interview uh, a teen writer than a teenage reader? So can I welcome Maddie Dean? Thanks, Ben. Um, so we're talking with Aisha Bushby here about her book, A Pocket Full of Stars, and then also your new upcoming book, um, uh, Moonchild of the Voyage of the Lost and Found. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a very wordy title. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm gonna have to type that out loads. Um, <laughs> it's a good like start bit of just Moonchild. So yeah, like, it's all a good yeah. Nice. Um, and so like, could you tell us like a bit about like yourself and like your journey to like becoming an author and also like more specifically, like why you've um, chosen to write kids books? Because like of all the categories and like um, genres, uh, kids book, I think, is a really interesting one to talk about because connecting with kids is quite difficult sometimes. So like, why did you? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, like what? Yeah. Um, so I... Um, I started writing, I think I started kind of think, I'm trying to think of like when I seriously wanted to do it as like, yes, I want this to be my job. And I think it was around 2015. I did my first national novel writing month. Um, okay. and it was the first time I managed to, uh, get to a book beginning to end. It was the absolute worst book ever written. in the history. <laughs> Um, I think my, my dad has a I'm pretty sure he has it on his computer. And I think he once said, I've got this. I can use this on you one day. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's on black mail material. <laughs> um, but it was for me just to kind of um, like get to the end of a story. Think, can I write 50,000 words? And then after that, I kind of started seriously trying to attempt like a novel that I, that I thought I could get published. Uh, turns out that one couldn't get published. <laughs> And then in 2017, I entered a short story competition um, with Stripes um, to be part of their anthology, A Change Is Gonna Come. And my short story was picked one of four people. Um, and then from there, I, I wrote A Pocket Full of Stars quite quickly. Um, I think I wrote it over like six weeks. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. After, after that got picked, I think it gave me the confidence to think, okay, I can... I can do this and um, it was contemporary and it was different to the book I'd been writing so I kind of sort of found something that was like along the same lines a similar like voice and I kind of went with it and um, then A Pocket Full of Stars was born in 2017 and then obviously yeah. you've got a couple of years um, after it gets taken on by a publisher and um, so it started that way um, and writing for children I just I don't think it was ever like a conscious decision. It was just the sort of fiction I was most drawn to. At, even now, I mostly read children's fiction and YA. Um, I read yeah. the adult book, but I just think that I'd rather spend my time reading children's fiction because it's what I enjoy the most. And I had a period of time in my life when I was like a teenager where I thought, oh, I've got to start reading adult books. And it actually made me stop reading. And it's, and it's made me realize that it's okay to be the sort of reader that's like actually children's books the books that I want to read um, and I think I love them the most because I get really bored with like like lots of description and lot and I think children yeah. kind of zip you along the story they're very plot driven which I like um, and even the ones that aren't just feel quite zippy and I really like that and I think that with children's books you can get to like the heart of what you're writing about and I think that also you don't have to worry about your genre as much um, so if you're writing yeah. about fiction, you kind of have to fit into a slot. With children's books, you can just kind of pitch any idea. And as, a, as really long as- wide and open. Yeah. Yeah. And I think A Pocket Full of Stars, if I aged that up, I don't actually think that would be taken on as an adult book because it's a, it's a weird mixture of like a few different things. Well, so it's a really like interesting age range, I think, that you've uh, written for. I mean, probably not a conscious de de decision in that sense, but I was kind of slightly- um, not nervous about reading it, but I can get lost, like lo lose interest in books very quickly. But the more I got into it, I just was so much more drawn to it. And I feel like as the character grew and the plot grew, that it kind of and kind of grew up in a sense. I kind of got more drawn in as a maybe an older reader, which was really interesting for me. And I ended up getting really um, 
attached to your main character staff like I as I said to you earlier I um before the in interview started that I actually cried at the ending because it's just such a pretty and beautiful but almost sad ending um and yeah it's just really interesting how you've kind of it's your um, on your website it says that it's kind of middle grade but yeah. it could definitely I think you could you maybe not adult but you could definitely age up for young adult because I honestly maybe if I was three years younger this would be my favorite book like it was really brilliant I can't say enough how amazing it was I really enjoyed it and I think I read it in like two sittings I had to like pace myself I think <laughs> I was like I've got to do other things today I can't just sit here and read this book oh, okay. do you know it's really weird hearing people say that because when you write your own book I have not read it since it was printed and really even reading passages now, like I read the same passage over and over and again, and it's my favourite one, the one that like makes me cringe the least. Um, <laughs> we had to read my first chapter um, for a video, and the whole time I was internally cringing. It's, it's, so it's really hard to like imagine how somebody else is going to react to a book that you've reworked so much yeah. and completely lose perspective. Um, but also, I originally wrote it thinking it was YA. So oh, yeah. you say that, so I, I had no idea really where, I just knew what the story was. And I think Sophia was meant to be in sixth form, but I think my voice was just younger naturally. And so I, I kind of, I kind of moved things around and kind yeah. of changed some of the issues that she goes through. Um, so it did age down. I think it does definitely work for that, just in terms of how she deals with some of the things that happen throughout the book. Is It is quite, it does take on that child almost kind of naivety towards things. Yeah. So I think definitely I think the right thing and kind of For me, yeah, because um, I was kind of tasked with aging it down. And obviously the subject matter is quite hard hitting. So I had to sort of think of a way to present it in a way that didn't feel like so depressing and um, so that's kind of video games for me was was just and and her like viewing the world through game just made yeah. it feel a little bit less hard. And how how did you like come up with the idea to like one like just the idea in general because it's quite I think unique I don't think I've really um thought about kind of video games with fantasy but it makes so much sense when you actually think about it because they're all about fantasy and losing yourself in it but like that kind of almost sci-fi um perception that we have of video games like how did you kind of come up with this and meld it into your book because it's quite integral but also not massively important to the plot yeah i, that, I think that's a really good observation actually and that's kind of speaks to how I came to it. So when I started the book, I knew I wanted to write a story about um, a young girl who tries to save her mum, who's in a coma. So I knew that was always going to be the story and I knew their relationship was going to be difficult. Um, but I was thinking a lot at the time about how in contemporary stories, I wanted to have a contemporary story that reflected like your traditional quest. So like she was like a knight. Um, and I also knew, separate to that, that she was going to really love video games. So actually, in my earlier drafts, those things were separate. So she, um, so the memory scenes were completely different. Um, she just woke up in the memory. She didn't wake up in a house and have to yeah. look like the clues. And the video game was just a hobby that she did alongside it. And then it was as I was editing that I was like, actually, like, duh, I need to put these two things together. <laughs> Why am I making them these two separate things? Um, so then I, I, it was like there was one evening where I couldn't get through my edit. So I was staying up to like 3 a.m. and I was playing Zelda. And I was like, here's a puzzle quest in Zelda. I don't know if you've ever played it, but they have these puzzle quests and for anybody who doesn't know. And um, you go into like this room and there's a puzzle and you have to just get through the puzzle. And I just really liked the contained element of that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so why don't I make each memory a puzzle that she has to solve? Um, and that's kind of when it came together. So yeah, it was, it hadn't come together at the beginning, but it's yeah. somewhere along the middle, which is why I think they do feel like slightly separate things, but also connected because they were. Um, yeah. And so like, as you, with the kind of progression of like you move, melding the video game aspect to the kind of quest aspect, how did you like find the Saf's personality and character developed as you were editing because she's quite a, she's a very complex character I think yeah. for young what young adult <laughs> I mixed that up then but for yeah. young adult she's a very complex character and I think that's really interesting that you managed to do that with a, a character so young I feel and maybe that's to do with the fact that you had her originally in sick form really I, I really appreciated how like 
complex she is and how she doesn't know her feelings sometimes and is really kind of anxious about certain things like how did that develop as you were writing and so I, editing? so I tend to not really plan my first drafts um so I kind of just I know you know usually the, like the beginning somewhere along the middle and maybe the end sometimes not always the end but I know kind of the wrong, I, I know barely anything when I go in, just, I have just one bit of the concept. And then so I kind of just write a really, really, really rough first draft. So I didn't really know who she was. And I don't think like all the time with Moonchild, it was much more conscious, but with A Pocket Full of Stars, I wasn't so conscious about what she was. And actually it took early readers to be like, oh, so she's really quite angry about things. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess she is. Um, and it's weird. It's, it takes other people to point it out to me yeah. um, sometimes. Um, I guess for me, I base a lot of my characters on a few different people, but not like their entire personality, just like an element of their personality. Um, so for me, part of her is based off like myself, but also there's another part of her, the, the part that like really struggles to speak and is really shy, that isn't like me at all, but is like people who I really care about, who are really close to me and I see them kind of struggle yeah. through. It. And so it was really important for me to kind of also show that, that people, people have range like we you can you can seem confident and loud but also be nervous about things and I, it's really important for me to have characters that aren't just like oh if she's shy and like lean into the stereotype of what being shy is or yeah I really I really liked her kind of the internal monologue of her as well like she would say um this is what I'd really like to say but the words just can't come out and I I I'm quite a confident person so that's not necessarily how I think of things and it kind of gave me a different point of view of how maybe someone else would be feeling in that situation um, and even we, me and Saf are very different personalities I mean she's a character I'm talking about her as a person I'm like wow I've really I'm really attached to this book now <laughs> um, but even I kind of had some kind of connection to that not necessarily the internal model monologue of being oh I wish I could say this but just some, sometimes her nervousness about having to confront certain things um yeah. which I think is a real skill I think getting people to connect to characters is brilliant and especially in YA <laughs> um the first yeah. person helped um get into her head a lot more because Moonchild's written in third person and I really really struggled actually to get into my character's head because I was just describing what was going on around them and I had a whole draft where my editor was like can we just get a bit more of what she's thinking. And it took me a while to figure out how to get into my character's head in third person. But I think, yeah, first person feels like a diary to me. Um, yeah. So to me, I was just kind of, I, it's, it's so natural to me to write in first person because I just think you just write down everything you would observe as you go along the situation. Um, yeah. And I didn't have to worry so much about what was going on around her. So I think a lot of it is, focused in her head which I think can feel cla claustrophobic at times which is why I struggle to read it back yeah yeah quite intense. especially if you kind of modeled her obviously not the, sh the shy parts you said but if you modeled gave her some of your personality it can be quite jarring to see yeah, your yeah. personality on paper kind of written out for you because that's quite a weird Thing, isn't it like I had a friend read that? it and she said this is you and I'm like oh it's not really entirely me <laughs> and when you come to the realization that you know I wrote this story and you don't obviously I was hoping it would get published but you don't really think about it and then suddenly it was like oh okay so there are going to be people who are going to see <laughs> my brain and it's really weird yeah and especially with the as you said the first person it being almost a diary that can be quite personal and like emotionally driven and so um one of my questions again was um did you feel like your uh, it was did you feel your personality was with staff but like did you experience some of the things that staff went through um yeah. like maybe with school or with your parents and like how is that that how did that influence your writing with staff like, yeah but quite a lot actually for this book I think for my first book it was like write what I know and then yeah. and then I kind of I just needed to get that one out there uh, <laughs> So there's different bits. So Get I think that one out of the way. <laughs> needed, there was just something I needed to just kind of purge into this book and kind of get all, the, all, the, all these kind of experiences into a book. Because I think that actually there's a, a, like a few different things she's going through. So my parents divorced when I was quite young. Um, and I just, and also 
one of my parents was from Kuwait, the other one's from Canada, but I lived in England and I moved from Kuwait. So it, it was really important for me to have this kind of, again, just show that like, there's, there's so many different elements to her life and that she's kind of torn between the two because that's how I've always felt. Yeah. Um, and then with the friendships, I wouldn't say it necessarily reflected friendships I had at school. Um, it's kind of a mixture of friendships I've had even kind of growing up, like even beyond school. I think it's a dynamic that people can, I think even adults have experienced that dynamic with a friend where you're like the sidekick and, and just having to, <laughs> having to kind of balance that out. So I think for me, it, was, it wasn't necessarily something that happened to me in year eight or, or anything like that. It was just something I've, I've felt sometimes with friends. Yeah. And I then, think, sorry. <laughs> what are you gonna say? But I was about to say that I think that you really capture that, that feeling, but also in a way that is relatable to children in that kind of year eight setting of, oh, you're, because as you go through, year seven to year eight it is quite a transition that I'm not sure many people talk about because you do find that people then find themselves in secondary school and they move on um, and de dealing with that is quite difficult and I think you really capture that kind of nervousness about moving on and having to make new friends when it's not necessarily the beginning of that year and I think everyone assumes that you make all your new friends in year seven but it's actually that period between year eight year nine kind of year ten that you really make those connections and year seven actually you I'm speaking from experience obviously <laughs> um but year seven you kind of hold on to the familiar because it's so different and like big and you're still kind of getting used to the new environment yeah I think you perfectly capture that kind of um, nervousness that we think you should have in year seven but actually comes later yeah I think also that isn't kind of you that's something I've experienced at lots of like the, the big moments in life um, so when you finish school and you're in your first couple of years of university again sometimes it takes a year or two to kind of make those new friendships and sometimes unfortunately it's a year or two into that new experience that you lose those other those kind of friendships from your kind of yeah. part of your life same when when I got my first job like you see a bunch of friendships just kind of like come in and out of your life in that way and it is always around these kind of key moments but it's never when they're happening it's always a little bit after yeah um, and I think for me I wanted to just talk about making new friends as well because I moved schools quite a lot when I was growing up so I always started when friendship groups were like established already um so I kind of wanted that feeling of like where you kind of feel like an outsider because you've come into something or yeah, there's exactly. something about the dynamic where you're like, I know I don't quite fit in. Yeah. Um, that was something I always felt just because I was always new. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to, to talk about friendships in that way. And then kind of the stuff to do with hospital was stuff that I'd personally gone through a couple of different experiences in my life and grief. And I think that one thing that struck me about grief is that it's just not what you think it's going to be. Um, it's so much more complicated than just feeling sad and crying. Yeah. Um, so many other emotions attached to it. And I think that I just wanted, especially for children who, because I went through sort of the situation Sophia went through when I was like much older, but actually for children, where do they turn to if they've, if they've gone through something like that? Um, I mean, I've, I've never read a book that kind of deals with it in that way and that kind of um the 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 quest that Saf goes on the ending is perfect but also not at all what you expect I found yeah, like, people say that and I'm like oh that's really interesting yeah yeah, yeah. but I it's perfect like I loved the ending because it's just kind of I think that really helps if I had read that as a child, I'd have I really understood what it meant to go through that, and I've I've not gone through any um, like grief like that. Um, but I think if there was a kid that had, I think that's a really you've put it in a really beautiful way that I think is really um, yeah. helpful um, to help them understand what they're feeling, but also give a different perspective on what maybe others are feeling and kind of give some relatability to that. Cause I've not necessarily read many books that deal with grief, I think in this way. And I think um, also actually not necessarily people who've experienced grief themselves, but people who are friends of people who are going through it. Um, I think a lot of the time people don't know what to do. So they do nothing. 
So they, they were like, oh, I didn't know what to say. So I said nothing. And actually, it's actually, I think, much better to say the wrong thing than say nothing. Um, and so what I kind of would hope that for people who haven't experienced it, but know somebody going through it, that it would help them know what that person might need. Yeah. Um, but also for me, it was really important to show that like you can be going through this horrible thing, but there could also be good things going on in your life. And yeah, like life goes on outside of that. Yeah, and it, and it really does. And you can actually, you can experience happiness about things at the same time as feeling sad. And I think sometimes we feel like it's one or the other. Um, yeah. But I mean, a lot of people spend a huge majority of their life having to grapple with both feelings. And I just think that, yeah, it was important for me to show that she could have that full range of emotion. Yeah, it's definitely not a black and white feeling that kind of, going through something quite traumatic but also having to go about everyday life you do see this contrast but I'm glad that you don't see you don't necessarily show that Saf is guilty about feeling um happiness in a time that's quite um traumatic and I guess that might be due to her kind of naivety to the situation because yeah. she is in year eight and hasn't been told a whole lot about her mother's situation but I think it's really refreshing seeing someone accept that they can be happy even when they're going through that kind of traumatic and I know it might be different for every single person but I think so often you see that people feel guilty about being happy or having exciting things happen to them while something else is happening um, and so I, I really appreciate that I think. Yeah. yeah thank you yeah I think that was it for me and I, I yeah I didn't want anyone to feel like I, I didn't want to kind of show guilt I, I think for me it's important to say actually if, if you are feeling that don't don't feel bad for yeah. laughing or smiling um yeah so that was kind of a key thing for me um another thing on a lighter note <laughs> um it's gone quite deep then um you reference fairy tales so much throughout the, the, the novel and I really loved that but the one that you kind of pinned down the most is Rapunzel yeah. and I was wondering is there like any kind of reasoning to that because um so often it's kind of not necessarily the first one that comes to mind I think when people think fairy tales yeah but, um I guess so it's probably a combination of different things so fairy tales was because I wanted a classic quest story so when I was thinking of like all the quests that I would be aware of it would be um fairy tale stories and Rapunzel in particular I, I liked the idea of because it was the idea of somebody at the top of the tower and there's like a, a, a like a prince saving her um yeah. I wanted to find a fairy tale I mean they're all about princes saving princesses <laughs> But I wanted it to be that Saf took on the role of the prince um, and, and just to show that actually, it, it, first of all, all, love isn't just romantic love. You can have, yeah. you know, love is love and you want to go and save someone. Like it doesn't have to be some like a love interest, but also it doesn't have to be done by a man. <laughs> um, like a woman can be doing the saving. So that, that was kind of a really important thing for me. Rapunzel was a mixture of different things. One, because... I liked, I'm obsessed with the film Tangled, so it's just one that's on Me my mind. Me too, anyway. such a good movie. <laughs> yeah, I just love Tangled. Um, and so like, that's on my mind anyway. So when I'm thinking of Rapunzel, I'm actually thinking of Tangled, which is probably really bad, because I should probably be like thinking of the actual fairy tale, but I do, I'm thinking of Tangled. Um, but also, um, hair, it was just like a big theme for me. In Kuwait, um, hair is a really big deal. Um, having really long hair okay, yeah. um, there's, like a, there's like a dance that you do where it's to do with like swishing your hair around I don't know how to explain it and also <laughs> my hair is too short yeah to, to illustrate how it works but like hair is just a huge part of the culture um to the point where I was not allowed to cut my hair short and I rebelled as an adult and it's now like, yeah. <laughs> longer than it should be because I can't get hair cut at the moment and so I, I really liked the connection between just this, just the theme of hair in in the story, and actually, like hair is a big thing for Amira and her uh, Amira. Yeah. Amira, Amira is my my protagonist from Moonchild, which I've been working on. Sophia, yeah. her mom, like hair is a is a thing between them. That's kind of what she. Amina, observed. her name's Amina, isn't it? I can yeah. see how that goes. Her, she's called Amira, and I just I'm just, I regret doing that. I'm so annoyed <laughs> because I keep confusing their names. It is really weird when your brain is on a different book. Yeah talking about a different character I don't know what I'm going to do when there's like more than three if there's hopefully more than three one day um 
yeah it's gonna be very confusing <laughs> i think yeah hair is just something that um connects her and her mum. um and so i kind of just wanted to play with that theme a little bit yeah and you talk about how hair is important in kuwait like was it really important to you to have that connection that she goes in her kind of quest she travel or goes to kuwait and yeah. experiences her mother's childhood in that sense like is yeah. was that really important to you having grown up and were you were you born in kuwait was that what you so said? i was actually born in bahrain because i was born around the time of the gulf war so um okay. my parents fled kuwait and then tried to come back in so they went to bahrain and then kind of well they went to canada and then bahrain and then they had to go back into kuwait through bahrain while my mom was heavily pregnant gave oh, birth wow. there okay. and then um, i think we went to kuwait when i was about one um, so I don't actually remember like Bahrain where I was born, which is like a really small country. If yeah. Anyone, I don't know where it is in the Middle East. Um, and so, yeah, I grew up in Kuwait and I didn't move to England till I was about eight or nine. But then as a teenager, I went back and forth as well. Um, so I did a few years of school there and here. So for me, it's just, it's just woven into like England and Kuwait are kind of equally woven into my life as an adult I haven't been able to go back as much as I'd like to but um it was so for me it was really important to have both especially because I think for a lot of people who write children's fiction um they kind of think back to those nostalgic childhood moments um yeah. but for me my kind of nostalgia is in Kuwait so it would just be really strange for me to write a book that didn't yeah the place of my childhood um, and so, and I want to end, but because I've kind of gone back and forth, I wanted to show the two different worlds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was yeah, you really, Kuwait. It was never going to, I was never going to not have that. Um, you really kind of um, integrate the cultures really well. And something that I really appreciate as well with your book is the fact that you, 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 it's so familiar to you that you don't overtly shove it in the reader's face i feel like this kind of cultural change you really subtly weave in these different i think the main thing that stands out to me is when um saf goes and it's this feast scene and her mother's i think um talking to her mum um and there's all this lovely food set out and you just kind of mention it and it makes me go oh that sounds really nice and really tasty but like you kind of you don't make the culture change really overt, overt. you really quite have it really seamlessly I think and I really appreciated that because it's not um jarring in any way even though it should be because she's going back and forth between these two places and um, the contrast is actually really soft and I think that's also to do with your lovely imagery of the house oh I honestly it's so gorgeous your imagery of the house like I could imagine it in my head and I was like I want to go there like when we're not, we're not no one's going on holiday at the moment I'm like that's where I want to go <laughs> well that's based off my granddad's house in Kuwait so every everything that features in my book is always based off a place that exists even in Moonchild it's they're on a boat but like I think I would roughly imagine my living room because it's quite small. So like I'd imagine the cabin being my living. I have to, I, there has to be something that I've Visual seen. Visual yeah. kind of build off of, yeah. And mm. like talking more about your writing, like um, are you, do you find it necessarily difficult to write something that you then don't have that visual kind of representation for like in your head or do you kind of just start with something and then go with the flow and then suddenly it moves into the next chapter and stuff it's a weird mixture so because moonchild's high fantasy it's a lot harder to get the visual references um because i'm making them up yeah and they're always based off reality or based off like somewhere i visited that i'll take a photo of and be like okay so if I want, so in Moonchild, um, it's set at a port and uh, you kind of go uphill. So I have like a photo of a place where, just to see how the houses cluster as they go kind of further up a hill, but then I'll yeah. paste it in with something else. So for me, it's about like literally creating a collage of like lots of different things and then making them a new thing. I, I don't know how I would just completely do something that I've not seen before. But yeah. um, when I write, I tend to imagine it like a film. Um, and it will be all these things that I've collected, then some start yeah. to play out together. Um, so that's kind of how I work through my descriptions, is I just kind of imagine I'm in a film and I'm just describing what the film is doing. Yeah. Your place, are you placing yourself like in 
the scene and like what yeah so it's from my perspective when I'm writing it I'm in the character's body in the film or like a like in a video game so when I when I go to yeah. school, I always tell kids to imagine when you write like you're playing a video game so it's kind of what's going on around you in your immediate vicinity yeah and what would you notice yeah um and like coming off of that do you I mean, this might be a stupid question, but like, do you experience writer's block? And like, how have you, what techniques have you curated, I guess, over the course of writing two books, like to overcome that? I experienced wanting to do anything but write why I have to write. I'm not <laughs> sure that, I'm not sure that I, I, not, I was gonna say, I'm not that I don't believe in writer's block because I'm, I'm sure it does happen. But for me, it's just about doing it. I don't, like, I don't know. I don't have like a, a technique apart from sometimes I really don't want to do it, but I have to because I have a deadline. So yeah. I think it's just about starting. Um, so if I'm struggling to start, I just, I'll do like writing sprints. So I'll do um, 20 minutes on then 10 minutes off. And I just force myself to sit down and do it even when I don't want to. And I think that comes from, um, when I started writing A Pocket Full of Stars, I was commuting to London. So I was on a train for like a couple of hours a day. Um, two to three hours was kind of my entire commute a day. And I would come home exhausted, but I had to get my words down. And I think it's just about like, and even at university, I, I learned, like I had to juggle a few different jobs while yeah. studying. And I think it's just when you're used to having to squeeze so much in you just realize that you, you have to there's just yeah. there's just no option but to do it um so i don't know i don't have tips apart from it's really great to go through situations where things like that are a necessity because you realize you don't really have the luxury to not do it yeah it's just quite practical I'm, I'm quite a practical person in that sense that i just do what i have to do um so yeah that's not very helpful but i think <laughs> Writing to get you going and just start and and then you'll carry on oh well, yeah brilliant um uh <laughs> i'm kind of i've said a lot of things and i'm trying to think of what i've maybe not said because i've like kind of just piled it all <laughs> in <laughs> yeah you kind of end up doing bits of different questions yeah um can you maybe just tell us a bit more about moonchild because that's coming out this august isn't it yes. it's a, a year later from a pocket full so yeah. it's kind of like um kismet isn't it that it's a year late exact like almost yeah. exactly later but yeah just tell us a bit about that and like maybe how you've come up with that because it's a slightly different um genre and idea to a pocket full yeah. of stars so yeah so um when i was contracted i was contracted for two books so i always knew i had to write something else and i actually really really struggled to come up with my next idea because after I finished A Pocket Full of Stars I was really trying to find ideas that was kind of similar to that book um, and I and I but then what I ended up doing was just writing like really cheap imitations of it oh, yeah. weirdly plagiarizing myself but making it worse <laughs> and so I had like about four drafts of different books with like one with a few thousand words and I think I got as far as 10,000 words in one draft and it's just it wasn't working I couldn't put anything together but alongside that, I had a fantasy idea. Um, I've always wanted to write high fantasy and I've always wanted to write a, a series. Um, mm -hmm. But it was something that I was like, well, this is too different. I can't do that with my next book. And so I was writing that alongside it. And I found myself being more drawn to that than the book I was contracted to do, which was really naughty. Um, so I, I said, like, having to, like, I, on the one hand, I'm saying, in my like in the previous question that like oh you just have to do what you have to do yeah <laughs> like doing this other project I was you're writing a whole different book yeah. <laughs> um, and then I finally kind of spoke to my agent I was like look I cannot I, and I think for me a pocket full of stars was a really draining process it's really really draining to write a book like that um I'm really glad I did it um but I think Part of what was stopping me was I just couldn't get in, into a headspace like that again. It was just a bit too much. It's very deep and um, mentally, I get what you mean by mentally draining because it's just, you have to be in the definitely the right mindset to read it, I think, and get through those difficult bits. So. I didn't realise it put me in a completely different headspace for about an entire year of my life. Um, 
and I was just like, I don't really want to go back there. <laughs> like I just, <laughs> um, just it, cause you, cause if you're editing and re like re-editing it, like you're, you're just going back into that place over yeah. and over again. Um, Especially so, from personal experience, you're just kind of re going yeah, over re those. It, and it was just, it was just a really, and it wasn't something I realized was affecting me that much till I came out of it. And I felt like relief and I was like, okay, do you not want to go back there? <laughs> Uh, for a while at least so yeah. I kind of said to my agent I, I'm it's not working can I just pitch this fantasy idea not thinking that my, I think I thought my publisher would be like no it's a bit too different but they were really up for it which I'm really really grateful for that they were kind of willing to just kind of jump in and I think they understood that A Pocket Full of Stars is the sort of book that like what do you write after that that feels yeah. like it and it just rather than trying to force a book to be like it they were just like let's just take the bits that make you Aisha the writer and, and put that in a different genre they were like okay with that um and I think because a pocket full of stars has magical elements they kind of let me let yeah me that route. um and yeah so it kind of started from that and um it's high fantasy it's based off the Arabian night stories and I think that kind of came off the back of I see a lot of stories that are based off European fairy tales um and I was like that's been done um, yeah. so I wanted to kind of write a, a series of books based off the Arabian night stories um, and just stuff that so I hadn't read them as a child but I'd known kind of bits and pieces growing up there's a lot of like superstition in my family in Kuwait and so mm -hmm. I'd hear bits and pieces um, of that growing up and it was really interesting to then read like kind of the origin of where that that came from and kind of see how like that was different and so I wanted to play with that a little bit and um, play with the structure so there's like a narrator um and you don't know the identity of the narrator and there's like stories within stories which is which is all to do with like the arabian nights i really like how it's structured as well so yeah. i want to play around with that so it again it's me kind of using other source material because i'm clearly not original enough <laughs> but um yeah so yeah that's so i'm i'm definitely going to be um uh, reading that um, having read A Pocket Full, I really love your style. I think you've really kind of nailed down your writing style and like how you write. And the chronology of um, A Pocket Full of Stars, I think is interesting. The fact that she does the, it's these flashbacks um, yeah. when she goes into them, but they're obviously of her mum. And like, I think that's a really interesting style that you've got with her kind of narration of watching these flashbacks. I really enjoyed reading that. Um, and so, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what was the most challenging aspect of writing A Pocket Full of Stars and what was the most challenging aspect maybe in contrast of writing Moonchild? Because they're very different books. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, they were totally different experiences. Moonchild, I managed to pull together in about like nine, ten months. A Pocket Full of Stars took me like a couple of years all in all. But um, well, it's part of the challenge, apart from like kind of the subject matter, which just got me in a really weird headspace. Um, putting like you said the flashback chapters and I think that I think when you really try, like I don't think people realize that how difficult it actually is because there might be oh I need to change just one thing about this scene and then it's like oh it's not relevant to the flashback anymore and I had to sit with revision cards over and over again and just move the flashback chapters around so everything lined up but didn't line up too perfectly so I wanted everything that happened to Sophia's mum to sort of reflect what was going on with her but I didn't want it to be so I didn't want it to reflect it so much that it became predictable and I yeah. wanted to kind of show that they're separate characters and then also just kind of throw in a few surprises. And there's a lot of like subplots in A Pocket Full of Stars. If you break it down to like the technicality, there's loads of little subplots. Yeah. The relationships that she has to tie up. So at the end, I had to tie everything up in, it just literally was just like sewing together or something. And it's like, right, I've got that and I've got that. Oh, I forgot that thing. And yeah. it was just such a complicated structure that it just, there were days where I was just like, it's not going to come to <laughs> I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. With Moonchild, I'd say the biggest struggle was um, the world building. Because I'm writing a high fantasy world, it was kind of, I can't borrow from stuff in our world. Um, so yeah, I'm creating, kind of creating a believable world. Um, and because I was, because I'd, I'd struggled so much to, to find the right book to follow up A Pocket Full of Stars with, I was quite behind on the schedule. So I didn't have a lot of time to just create this like entire world mm -hmm. um, to make, because we, we always knew this book was going to come out in August. 
Um, so I had to like squeeze myself into the schedule. When I finally, when I finally got on track, I was like, great. Now, just got to build a whole world. Great. That, that. <laughs> You've just got to build a whole new world and new ideas. <laughs> that's quite a, that's quite intimidating. Like how, like I don't understand, like, I don't think I could do that really like well, having to I, I borrowed from the Reagan nights because like yeah. I, I, there was a lot of stuff to do with that that kind of helped me along the way and um it's because it's because it has short stories in it I don't think I could ever write a book that's just beginning to end yeah um, I think I always write something that's got like that gets interrupted in some way and I think that for me I kind of I mean, that's that's really nice though because it, it does give you a little bit of a break so I think with with um in a pocket full especially with the flashbacks it gives you a little bit of a break from the friends because i know that i got really annoyed at emmy <laughs> i was like i like, oh, can't stand her like don't like her and so having those flashbacks i think take you away from maybe the bits yeah. that are a bit um uncomfortable or maybe um obviously you have to read it but you're kind of they're like oh, i just don't like that character let's <laughs> let's read the flashback that'll be good because i always enjoyed the flashbacks I, chapters slash bits and so I guess that's really nice in that aspect having that kind of the different lead-offs I guess so yeah um <laughs> I'm not sure I think we've gone through the majority of the questions yeah, we've got through apart from what was the most rewarding aspect of writing the two books and releasing them out into the world to be read obviously Moonchild in August but what's been the best bit of it I think it's when, so when you, like, when you start writing a book, you have this vision of what you want to create. And the first draft is nowhere near. The second draft is kind of near, but you can't really see the end of the light. And I think it's when you get to the end and you feel like you did the job you set out to do, there's always a moment where I'll read it back and I go, okay, that's it, that's done. Um, and incidentally, with Moonchild, we are be, we're going to print tomorrow, I think. Um, and I was up... <laughs> at 3 a.m. last night so I was trying to sleep and I kept thinking of like little things that were nagging at me and I sent my editor an email at like 3 a.m. being like I'm really sorry just final thing but um, <laughs> I felt like yesterday was the first day that I had that kind of like my brain literally goes tick it's like a big green tick yeah. in my mind yesterday was the first day that it did that and there's just this like peace that comes with it like obviously you're still scared about how people are going to react to it and if they enjoy it and all of that but internally I'm like I did the best job I could do and yeah. that's just like I can't control what happens next um because it's not for me anymore so yeah that moment for me when I'm like I, I read it back and I'm like it's not the it, you know it's never going to be perfect um it's not as good as some other books I've read that I've loved I'll never feel that way about my own writing I'll never think it's good but when I think I, I had this goal and I achieved the goal then that for me is like the best part um mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you about your book because I thank just you, I really, really enjoyed it. I've got it here and I've got all my <laughs> post-it notes in it. And I'm just, I think a couple of them are just like, I love this metaphor. And <laughs> so I, I really did enjoy your book. Um, you. And you'll be able to find this in the bookshop. Um, I'm sure Ben will stock it um, or has already stocked it. Um, so yeah, just thank you for your time. Um, I've really enjoyed thank talking you, Thank to you to Ben for having me as well. Thank you to Aisha and well done to Maddie for that wonderful interview. Um, you can buy the book from the shop on 01442 827 653. Um, all other booking details are in the blurb below this video. Um, so we've got loads more to come uh, and loads of interviews um, lined up and uh, probably another half a dozen already pre-recorded. So uh, do watch your space. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, it's a simple free process and it just means you get an email every time I post a new author interview. Um, thanks again and we'll see you for the next one.